So, I'll be starting with the secondary glaucoma. Secondary glaucoma, if you remember, was the one where we were having the known cause. Cause is known. In the primary glaucomas, we were not knowing the cause. But here, the glaucoma is due to a particular reason. That is called a secondary glaucomas. So, the first here, we have the lens-induced. Lens-induced glaucomas. This we have already covered in the topic of cataract. Like, we had seen number uh, A was your phaco morphic phacomorphic glaucoma so we know that it was occurring due to which stage of cataract phacomorphic was occurring due to immature immature senile cataract this is your phacomorphic then we know about the phacolytic phacolytic glaucoma phacolytic glaucoma is the most common lens induced glaucoma this is the most common lens induced glaucoma it is the most common lens induced glaucoma and which stage was causing this this is caused by the morgagnian morgagnian stage of the hypermature senile cataract Morgagnian type of hypermature senile cataract. Now, there is one more thing that you should know here that when there is lytic, so we have the lysis of the cortex proteins. We have the lysis of the cortex proteins here. And if you remember, lens has sequestered antigens lens has sequestered antigens so the proteins which are present in the lens have the antigens therefore it can lead to the phaco anaphylactic phaco anaphylactic uveitis so these proteins which are being released due to the lysis, these proteins can actually lead to anaphylactic reaction, which is an inflammatory response. And therefore, I can have what you call as phaco anaphylactic uveitis. Both will come from the same stage, that is, Morgagnian type of hypermature senile cataract. So, there are a um, few important things here the phacolytic glaucoma. Phacolytic glaucoma is the most common glaucoma, not the most common secondary glaucoma. It is the most common lens-induced glaucoma. Second thing, it is occurring due to the Morgagnian type of hypermature senile cataract. Now, the same stage can also lead to the phacoanaphylactic uveitis. The same stage can also lead to phacoanaphylactic kind of uveitis due to what? Due to the sequestered antigens, right? Then coming to the next one, C. We have phacotopic. Phacotopic glaucoma. The phacotopic glaucoma occurs due to, due to the sclerotic type. Sclerotic type of hypermature senile cataract. So we have already read about them. I am just writing the names. Phacotopic. Topic means position. So that glaucoma which is occurring due to the changes in the position of the lens that is called as phacotopic glaucoma. It is occurring due to the sclerotic type of hypermature senile cataract. Then we have D. This is your phacotoxic. Phacotoxic glaucoma. Phacotoxic glaucoma occurs due to the PCR. Do you remember what was PCR? PCR means here we have got posterior capsular rupture. It occurs due to the posterior capsular rupture. So, these are your lens induced glaucomas that is number one. Now, coming to number two. 
नंबर टू इज योर इंफ्लमेटरी ग्लोकोमास नंबर टू इज द इंफ्लमेटरी ग्लोकोमास so was first glaucomas were occurring due to the cataract second is occurring due to the uveitis the glaucomas which are occurring due to the uveitis are called as inflammatory glaucomas or it is also called as hypertension uveitis or it is also called as hypertension uveitis do you remember what was the drug of choice tell me the drug of choice here we had discussed this on the previous turn right on the group what is the drug of choice give me the answer then we will discuss this inflammatory glaucoma now if you look at the mechanism number 1 is your acute inflammatory glaucoma acute inflammatory glaucoma so when we have uveitis we have release of inflammatory cells due to the trabecular blockade so these inflammatory cells will block the trabecular meshwork and you will have acute inflammatory glaucoma then number 2 it can be due to the ring synecy it can be due to the ring synecy we have discussed this totally how the ring synecy can lead to iris bombe formation then the angle closure then uh, first the acute congestive then chronic congestive that and the third one it can also lead to steroid induced it can also lead to the steroid induced glaucoma because those people who are having uveitis okay they are on steroids for a very very long period and you already know we have gtcs so the topical steroids can cause glaucoma so because you are giving the steroids for a very long time topical one they can also develop yes why only two answers why only two answers i want everybody to give me the answer yes answer is correct it is dpvfrin dpvfrin is the drug of choice for hypertension uveitis so this is your inflammatory glaucoma inflammatory glaucoma then the third one then see the third one third one is the neovascular neovascular glaucoma neovascular glaucoma occurs due to the rubiosis iridis it occurs due to rubiosis iridis rubiosis iridis means neovascularization over the iris if you have neovascularization over the iris it is rubiosis iridis so this will lead to the zip like adhesions this will lead to the zip like adhesions in the angle of anterior chamber this leads to zip like adhesions in the angle of anterior chamber so can you tell me which type of glaucoma it is open angle glaucoma or angle closure glaucoma who will tell me tell me which kind of glaucoma it is you have the neovascularization over the iris which has led to the zip like adhesions in the angle of anterior chamber so will it be open angle or angle closure tell me the answer so let's see the etiology what are the conditions which can lead to neovascularization so the most common is the pdr we will be studying this today pdr this is your proliferative proliferative diabetic retinopathy this is most common most common is pdr then you have got what you call as the crvo crvo this also we will be reading today central retinal venous occlusion now when you have this in the 
CRVO then it is also called as this is also called as 100 day glaucoma. The neovascular glaucoma which is occurring in CRVO this is also called as 100 day glaucoma. This was asked as a direct question in NEET 2018. Direct question had come. Then we also have the Eels disease. Eels disease bhi aaj hum log pedenge. This is vitreous hemorrhage. Then you have the sickle cell. Sickle cell retinopathy. Now we will not be studying the sickle cell retinopathy in the retina. But this you should know from the systemic diseases. You read the sickle cell disease in the medicine and all. So you should know this that in the sickle cell retinopathy also we have ischemia and due to ischemia we have this proliferation. Then you have the intraocular intraocular tumors. Tumors will also show the neovascularization. So these are the causes of neovascular glaucoma. What is 100 day glaucoma? Now most common neovascular glaucoma is actually found in the PDR. But when they are asking you specifically the 100 day glaucoma, then your answer is CR view. So what kind of glaucoma it is? Let me see what you have answered. Exactly, yes. Everybody has given the right answer. It is not open angle. It is the angle closure glaucoma because the zip-like adhesions are formed in the angle of anterior chamber, right? So this was your third one, neovascular glaucoma. Now coming to the fourth one. Now coming to the fourth one, this is your pigmentary glaucoma. The fourth is the pigmentary glaucoma. Pigmentary glaucoma occurs due to the pigment deposition. This is occurring due to the pigment deposition in the trabecular meshwork. So we have pigment deposition in the trabecular meshwork. So whether it is open angle glaucoma or it is angle closure glaucoma. Again tell me the answer. Here you have pigment deposition. You have pigment deposition in the trabecular meshwork. So we have pigment deposition in uh, anterior segment per se specifically the trabecular meshwork also. So we you get the two important signs. Tell me the answer also whether it is open angle or angle closure. You have to answer this. Now two important signs that you get in pigmentary glaucoma. Very very important. You usually get the question on this. One is your Krukenberg spindles. Krukenberg spindles. And second is the Sempaulesis line. Krukenberg spindles and Sampaulesis line are the two important clinical uh, signs, sorry, two important signs that you get in cases of pigmentary glaucoma. Now, what is the Krukenberg spindles? It is the pigments. Pigments on the posterior surface of the cornea. If you have the release of the pigment and these pigments are deposited on the posterior surface of the cornea, then this is called as Krukenberg spindles. While what is Sempaulesis line? This is a gonioscopic finding. This is a gonioscopic finding. It is seen on gonioscopy where you get the pigments. Along the shawl base line. Here you see the pigments around the shawl base line. What was shawl base line? The prominent end of the desmans membrane of the cornea. So you should know what is the Krukenbach spindles, what is Sempaulesis line. Okay, then you should also know that it is a gonioscopic finding. Right? So what have you answered here? Very good. Again, everybody has given the right answer. 
it is actually the open angle glaucoma not the angle closure because you are having the blockade in the trabecular meshwork and the word trabecular blockade itself says that the angle is open right then coming to the next one the fifth one the fifth is your steroid induced glaucoma so if i talk about the steroid induced glaucoma per se it is due to the now there are uh, more than one mechanisms which have been explained for steroid induced glaucoma but i will tell you the main reason or the main etiology the main etiology is the deposition it is the deposition of gag what is gag gag is the glycoso amino glycans glycoso amino glycans it is due to the deposition of glycoso amino glycans in the trabecular meshwork so due to the deposition of glycoso amino glycans in the trabecular meshwork it is occurring again i am having a blockade in the trabecular meshwork so this is also a secondary open angle kind of glaucoma now the main thing is that do everybody who is on steroids the topical steroids will get this no everybody will not get this so there is a term called as steroid responder there is a term called as steroid responder so everybody is not a steroid responder you have got the um, high steroid responder then you have the moderate steroid responder and then you have the low low steroid responder so everybody is not coming under the high steroid responder only 5% of the people are under the category of high steroid responder and these people will eventually develop this steroid induced glaucoma so everybody who is taking the steroids will not develop the glaucoma so 35% are moderate 35% people come in the moderate category and rest 60% are coming under the low category so most of the people will not develop the glaucoma most of the people will not develop the glaucoma so only those who are high steroid responders and they have got the high risk factors only they will develop the glaucoma this is your glaucoma number 5 the fifth one is the steroid induced glaucoma then coming to the next the sixth one the sixth is your epidemic dropsy epidemic dropsy epidemic dropsy is actually a hyper secretory glaucoma this is the hyper secretory kind of glaucoma hyper secretory means there will be increased secretion of the aqueous humor i told you that there are three methods how aqueous humor is formed we had diffusion we had ultrafiltration and we had secretion so the most important was secretion and here also we have increased secretion of aqueous humor this is also a secondary open angle kind of glaucoma so it is a hyper secretory glaucoma it is a secondary open angle glaucoma and it is a glaucoma which occurs due to the food poisoning it is occurring due to the food poisoning so what happens here we have got a alkaloid that is called as sanguinarine we have a alkaloid sanguinarine alkaloid right so this uh, sanguinarine is present in the argimon mexicana this sanguinarine is present in the argimon mexicana and argimon mexicana is present as adulterant this is actually added as the adulterant in the mustard oil 
so those people who are actually adulterating the mustard oil with the argimone mexicana which contains the sanguinarine that is responsible for this glaucoma you should know the name of sanguinarine argimone mexicana mustard oil right this is your sixth variety then coming to the seventh then the seventh is your traumatic traumatic glaucoma even trauma can also cause glaucoma so in every chapter trauma is also covered side by side and alag se bhi we will be dealing with the trauma now trauma can lead to glaucoma by several by several mechanisms trauma can also lead to glaucoma by the several mechanisms like number 1 we can have uveitis trauma can lead to inflammation and inflammation can lead to the glaucoma then number 2 we can have hyphema we can also have the hyphema hyphema means the blood in the anterior chamber so if there is a rupture of some blood vessels okay this is a uh, most commonly due to the major arterial circle it is most commonly due to the rupture from the major arterial circle so you have blood in anterior chamber so the amount of fluid will increase and that will lead to glaucoma so it can be due to inflammation it can be due to hyphema then number 3 it can also be due to the angle recession it can also lead to angle recession now again this is a important term many times asked what is angle recession angle recession means tear of the ciliary body if you have the tear of ciliary body face between the root of iris and the scleral spur and the scleral spur so there is actually the widening of this angle because if you remember the angle structures what were the angle structures we were having the root of the iris ciliary body band then the scleral spur trabecular meshwork and the shawl base line so i am talking about this ciliary body band here i am talking about this ciliary body band this is actually getting teared between the root of the iris and the scleral spur this glaucoma is called as angle recession glaucoma this glaucoma is called as angle recession glaucoma so you have different kind of glaucoma due to the trauma different kind of trauma due to the glaucoma right now we come to the eighth one the eighth one is your ciliary ciliary block glaucoma also called as malignant glaucoma or the inverse glaucoma this is called as ciliary block glaucoma malignant glaucoma or the inverse glaucoma now this is actually quite important why this occurs due to the misdirection of misdirection of the ciliary processes this is occurring due to the misdirection of ciliary processes during the intraocular surgery when you are performing when you are doing any intraocular surgery there could be misdirection of the ciliary processes what is the most common intraocular surgery the cataract surgery 
So it could be cataract surgery or it could be glaucoma surgery. So whenever you have misdirection of the ciliary processes during the intraocular surgery, there will be accumulation of accumulation of the aqueous humor in vitreous cavity. There will be accumulation of the aqueous humor in the vitreous cavity. I will show you how this is happening. See, this is, these are your layers of the cornea. This is the iris here, ciliary body. And uh, this is the lens here. This is your vitreous cavity. So, in the vitreous cavity, I will have vitreous, which is gel-like. So, I have this vitreous here. That is not a problem. Now, normally, the ciliary processes are directed anteriorly like this. The ciliary processes are directed anteriorly. So, when you have release of the aqueous humor, this will also go anteriorly like this. This will go in this anterior chamber. Then it will go in the angle of anterior chamber. And 90% drainage will take place through this trabecular outflow. This is the normal thing. This is your normal. How this is taking place? This is your normal one. Now, when you have the misdirection of the ciliary processes. So, if I have the misdirection of the ciliary processes, now the ciliary processes are coming something like this. They are directed posteriorly. Here also, they are directed posteriorly. So, when they are directed posteriorly, something like this, right? So, now the aqueous humor will be going in the vitreous cavity. That is why you have accumulation of aqueous humor in the vitreous cavity where you have no outflow channel. No outflow channel is actually present in the vitreous cavity. Therefore, it is dangerous. Also, what is formed there? What is formed at this level? You have what you call as the cilio lenticular. You also have cilio lenticular block. Why it is called as the ciliary block glaucoma? Because you have the formation of the blockade. Like here, we are having the block between the ciliary processes and this lens. So, this blockade is called as cilio lenticular blockade. So, aqueous humor is not able to go anteriorly. Now, because you are not having any outflow channel, you do not have any outflow channel here. That is why it is called as malignant glaucoma. So, I am also telling you why it is called as ciliary block glaucoma and why it is called as malignant glaucoma. So, how should I treat it now? What should I do? Let's see the treatment. The treatment of choice is the atropine. The treatment of choice which is used here is actually the atropine. Why atropine is used as the treatment of choice? Because atropine breaks the ciliary block. This atropine helps in breaking the ciliary block. How can I break this ciliary block? Now, let us try to imagine. Suppose this was like this and we had this iris here. We had the ciliary body and uh, we have having the lens here. And uh, we were having the ciliary processes that were causing the blockade here. Now, when I give the atropine, then what will happen? It will dilate the uh, pupil. So, this will actually dilate the pupil and also pulls the ciliary body. So, when it is pulling the ciliary body, therefore, pulls the ciliary processes. 
So it will also pull the ciliary processes and opens the block. This is how it opens the block. So how it will take place? How it will take place? So now it will be something like this. Pupil is dilated, ciliary body pulled up and the ciliary process is also going up and uh, you have lens lying here right and uh, you have um, the vitreous here which was containing the aqueous humor this was containing this aqueous humor so this aqueous humor can now flow anteriorly because you have opened the block that is why that is why this is considered to be the treatment of choice this is considered to be the treatment of choice now because atropine is a atropine is a midriatic this atropine is a midriatic which is the treatment of choice here therefore it is also called as inverse glaucoma therefore this glaucoma is called as inverse glaucoma because it is opposite in angle closure glaucoma what we were doing we were using meiotic so this is only glaucoma where you are using the midriatic as a treatment of choice that is why inverse glaucoma so why this is called as malignant glaucoma why this is called as ciliary block glaucoma and why it is called as inverse glaucoma all the three things are very very clear this was the treatment number one that we were giving. What else I can do? Number two, I will also give the IV mannitol. We also give the IV mannitol. Mannitol to decrease, to decrease the vitreous volume. In order to decrease the vitreous volume. Now, if you remember, we had read this that the mechanism of action of hyperosmotic drugs was to decrease the vitreous volume. Why I want to decrease the vitreous? Because aqueous humor was present in the vitreous cavity. So, I want to decrease the vitreous volume. Number three, I also give the acetazolamide. Acetazolamide to decrease the aqueous formation in order to decrease the aqueous formation i also give the acetazolamide so less aqueous formed less will go into the vitreous cavity whatever is present i am using mannitol to decrease it so these two together will also decrease the intraocular pressure the advantage is you are decreasing the aqueous volume you are decreasing the vitreous volume and you are also Decreasing the intraocular pressure. Number four, if you have some residual vitreous volume, so for that you can do vitreous aspiration. We can also do the vitreous aspiration by the posterior, by the posterior sclerotomy. So, if I have more of the vitreous lying inside the vitreous cavity, I can give a small hole in the sclera and I can aspirate. So, this is the total treatment of the ciliary block glaucoma. Total treatment of ciliary block glaucoma. So, this completes your topic of glaucoma. Give me a thumbs up if you have understood all the eight varieties of the secondary glaucoma. Anything that you have uh, to ask or any doubt, give me a thumbs up if you have understood all the varieties of secondary glaucoma so that we can start with the next topic, retina. Yes, I can see the first. Anything? Yes. So, everybody has understood it. Good. So, now we start with the retina. Now, we start with the retina. 
so as you know retina is actually the innermost innermost coat of the eyeball it is the innermost coat of the eyeball the extent of the retina is from the ora serrata ora serrata to the optic disc margin from the ora serrata to the optic disc margin how aphakia causes glaucoma actually you will be able to understand only after we have done the optics so i'll be telling you there okay extent is from the ora serrata to the optic disc margin ora means origin this is the origin of the retina serrated means uneven uneven margin from which the retina is starting this is the cornea then you have the iris the ciliary body so from the ciliary body you have choroid and outer to this you have sclera now the retina starts from the serrated margin this is your ora serrata ora serrata is important this ora serrata this is actually the thinnest thinnest area of the retina the thinnest area of the retina is this ora serrata then it is extending backwards it is going like this so i will make it thickening because you have got so many layers in the retina we have got 10 layers in the retina and one layer continues to form the optic nerve which is myelinated so i'll make it whitish this is your optic nerve so it is the optic disc margin so from the ora serrata to the optic disc margin is the retina and from the area from where it is coming out through the sclera the area of the sclera through which it is coming out this part is called as lamina cribrosa this part is called as lamina cribrosa cribri from appearance sieve like channi jaisa dikhta hai because all these fibers are coming out you had seen this in glaucoma also yes so this was the extent of retina what is lamina cribrosa and what is the thinnest part of the retina we have done this now coming to the parts of retina you can mainly divide the retina into the central retina and the peripheral retina we can also call it as fundus when you visualize the retina this is also called as fundus so you can see the central fundus as well as peripheral fundus central area and peripheral area the central area consists of the optic disc and the macula lutea the central retina or the central fundus again consists of two parts the optic disc and the macula lutea optic disc is present on the nasal side while the macula is present on the temporal side the optic disc is present on the nasal side while macula lutea is present on temporal side optic disc is also called as optic nerve head or it is also called as 
ब्लाइंड स्पॉट ऑफ मैरियॉट it is also called as blind spot because you cannot see at that point it is also called as blind spot of mariot while macula lutea present on temporal side this is also called as yellow spot this is also called as yellow spot it is yellowish in color it is yellowish due to pigments we have xanthophyll pigment then we have eurochrome pigment so we have more pigments in the macula that is why it is appearing yellowish in color so it is also called as macula lutea or the yellow spot so on one side that is your nasal side we have the optic disc which is called as blind spot of the mariot on the other side that is your temporal side we have macula lutea yellow spot due to the presence of the pigment xanthophyll and eurochrome now we will try to draw it suppose this is your central fundus central area so this central area suppose this is your uh, nasal side and this is the temporal side so on this background we will be drawing it so on the nasal side i will have the optic disc suppose this is the optic disc present on the nasal side so on the temporal side i will have what you call as what you call as macula now inside the macula i have another thing that is your fovea centralis and this is of same size same size as that of the optic disc and outer to this we have macula something like this so this is much larger so i can say this is the optic disc the diameter is 1.5 mm the diameter of the optic disc is 1.5 mm present on the nasal side now because optic disc is present on the nasal side okay so this will lead to the blind spot this will lead to the blind spot on the temporal side because the visual field is always diagonally opposite the visual field is always diagonally opposite like if you see here this is the cornea here and uh, we have a eyeball here so somewhat nasally is your optic nerve so if i divide this into two parts this is the nasal retina and this is the temporal retina so nasal retina has this nasal retina has the optic nerve head nasal retina has the optic nerve head so this is lying in the nasal side here so the visual field that is corresponding will be the temporal side this will correspond to the temporal field temporal visual field so i will have the blind spot in the temporal visual field while the temporal retina mein kya hoga you will have the macula you have macula in the temporal retina so this is projecting in the nasal visual field this is projecting in the nasal visual field this was projecting in the temporal visual field this is the difference between the retinal fibers and the visual field are you getting this because every time you people get confused uh, between these things that if i have optic disc on the nasal side why i have blind spot on the temporal side because visual field will be diagonally opposite so i will have the blind spot 
corresponding to that optic disc on the what you call as temporal site, temporal field. So this uh, this thing is very very clear to everyone now. Okay. So coming back to here, we were discussing the optic disc is one point five mm. Now on the temporal side, I do have this larger one. This is macula. This is five point five mm. Macula is five point five mm. Then inside this we have this. This is called as fovea centralis. This area is called as fovea centralis. The diameter is again one point five mm. The diameter is one point five mm. And in the center, I have a very very small area. Very small area. This small area is actually called as the foveola. This is called as foveola. So I have macula. I have macula five point five. Fovea centralis one point five. Foveola. This is zero point three five. Then you have foveola that is zero point three five. An optic disc one point five. Now another important thing is if you look at if you look at uh, the distance if you look at the distance between this foveola if you look at the distance between this foveola and the optic disc margin so how much is this distance the distance between this foveola and the optic disc margin is fixed two disc diameter this is two times the disc diameter what is disc diameter 1.5 mm so this will be 2 into 1.5 3 mm again a uh, important question so this is your 3 mm so the different diameters their orientation their fields this is very very important now how to tell that which side i is which side i is this suppose you are seeing the funders and uh, something like this you are seeing then how will you come to know whether it is right eye or it is left eye how will you come to know see the optic disc is nasally macula is temporally macula is temporally so means macula of the right eye will be present on the right side and macula of the left eye will be present on left side so wherever you have macula that side i it is yes so this is right side and this is your left side so i am getting the macula on right side so this is right eye whichever side you have macula that side i it is because macula is on temporal side so macula of right eye will lie on the right side macula of the left eye will lie on the left side so this is very very clear now yes now uh, another important thing is that the fovea centralis fovea centralis is the place where the sharpest image the sharpest image is formed fovea centralis is the place where the sharpest image of the object is formed or i can say the sharpest image of the object is formed on which part of the retina it is the fovea centralis now why it is so because it is densely packed with the cones 
because this area is densely packed with cones no rods here relatively i am not having any rods here i am having cones so this is giving you the sharpest image now i can divide this fovea centralis into two parts one is the floor and another is the rim we have the floor area and the rim area the floor is the thinnest part of the retina floor is the thinnest part of the retina while the rim is the thickest part thickest part of the retina now you will say that i have already told you that actually the ora serrata was the thinnest so overall if say say overall then the thinnest is the ora serrata so if both are given you have to go with the ora serrata if they have not given both then go with the fovea centralis the thinnest part of the retina so this is thinnest because here the number of layers are also very very less the number of the layers that you have is also very very less here yes so that also i'll be talking about then another important thing is that you have fovea you have the fovea so fovea is responsible for the fovea reflex fovea is responsible for the fovea reflex this is a shining reflex a shining reflex which is coming from the macula so that is coming from the fovea another important thing is the foveal a vascular zone another important thing is foveal a vascular zone this is foveal foveal a vascular foveal a vascular zone so what is this foveal a vascular zone it is actually inside the fovea centralis and outside the foveola it is inside the fovea centralis but it is outside the foveola 0.4 to 0.6 mm in the diameter foveal a vascular zone lies inside the fovea centralis but outside the foveola it is a area of 0.5 to 0.6 mm in diameter having no vascular supply this area is not having any vascular supply now because this area is not having any of the vascular supply therefore one thing is important here that laser photocoagulation laser is contraindicated here so you should not do laser i can do the laser in the periphery i can do the laser in the uh, surrounding areas but i will not do the laser especially in this area because no blood supply already it is ischemic yes then another important thing is your ophthalmoscopy ophthalmoscopy because you know this is a important instrument with the help of which you are seeing the retina ophthalmoscope so you have got three kind of ophthalmoscopy one is distant direct ophthalmoscopy that is ddo then number 2 we have direct ophthalmoscopy do and number 3 you have indirect indirect ophthalmoscopy this is your io you have got three kind of ophthalmoscopy distant direct direct and indirect now 
these two, the distant direct and the direct of thermoscopy is done by the direct of thermoscope. These two are done by the direct of thermoscope while indirect of thermoscopy is done by the indirect done by the indirect of thermoscope. So, if they ask me is 3, how many kind of of thermoscope? Then it is 2. We have got 3 kind of of thermoscopy, but we have got 2 kind of of thermoscope. Now, first I will tell you the difference between the Direct of thermoscope and the indirect of thermoscope. I will show you the picture also. What is the difference between direct of thermoscope and the indirect of thermoscope? Direct of thermoscope is used to see the central fundus. It is used to see the central fundus, central retina. Indirect is used for the periphery while the indirect is used for the periphery. How much is the area that is seen? Direct of thermoscope say you can see 2 disc diameter, just 2 disc diameter, just 3 mm. Indirect of thermoscope say you can see 8 disc diameter, much larger area 8 disc diameter. Then look at the image, what kind of image is formed? So, direct of thermoscope produces virtual erect and magnified. Virtual erect and magnified. While if you look at the indirect of thermoscope, you have real inverted and magnified. You have got real inverted and the magnified real inverted and magnified now if you look at the uh, direct of thermoscopy the magnification is very very high this is 15 times you are having 15 times magnification but if you look at the indirect of thermoscopy, magnification is much less. It is 5 times. It is much less 5 times. So, though it is magnified in both, but it is much less by indirect because there you are seeing larger area. More area, less magnification, less area, more magnification. Yes. So, which is better for a hazy media? Now, suppose my patient is having diabetic retinopathy. I want to see this patient's retina, but he is having cataract. Okay. So, what if the patient is having hazy media? Uh, maybe he is having uveitis or he is having cataract or he is having any corneal opacity. Then, what is better? Indirect of thermoscopy is better. Then in these cases, it is the indirect of thermoscopy which is better. These are the differences between the direct of thermoscope and indirect of thermoscope. Now, what is actually the distant direct of thermoscopy? Distant direct of thermoscopy is the direct of thermoscopy. It is the direct of thermoscopy from a distance. So, when you are doing the direct of thermoscopy from a distance, it is called as distant direct of thermoscopy. How much is this distance? So, that is variable 25 centimeter or 33 centimeter or 40 centimeter. Different books will give you different answer. So, when you are doing the direct of thermoscopy from a distance, it is called as distant direct of thermoscopy. So, you have some orientation about uh, the retina, its uh, extent, its parts, how do you visualize it. So, let us have a look over the retina. See, this is your normal fundus. This is your 
normal fundus can you see you are having a reflex here this is called as the red reflex this is called as the red reflex or uh, this is also called as the red glow this is also called as a red glow. This you will see in uh, the questions also, clinical scenario type of questions. They say a red glow is present. Now, some people say it is a yellowish glow. Some people say pink, uh, yellow, orange, whatever, red. Uh, uh, this is a difference in the perseverance. But it's a bright uh, color that you are getting. And why you are getting this bright color? Because you have the choroid behind. Because of the choroid. So basically, choroid is the reason behind the color of the retina. Otherwise, retina does not have that much of color that it will appear reddish in color. So if you have something in the vitreous cavity that is blocking that capillary blood flow seeing, so then you will not see that reddish appearance. Then there will be absence of that red glow. Like for example, if I have a lot of hemorrhage in the vitreous cavity, it will block that um, uh, glow coming from the choroid and the choriocapillaries, then there will be absence of the red glow. So this red glow is due to the choriocapillaries. Then on uh, the nasal side, I have this optic disc. This is the nasal side. This is the right side. This is, therefore, this area will be your macular area. Macular area will be temporal. So, this is left side. This is the left side. On the left side, I have macula. So, therefore, it is left eye. So, I can say this fundus is left eye. Are you getting this? It's very easy to tell. Yes, Radhika, I will give you a minute. Again, I will come back and I will show you the differences. Don't worry, beta. I will give you time to note down that. Don't worry about that. But have you understood this thing? That which eye it is? Then uh, see this. This is your central retina. This is your central retina. In the central retina, what are the things that you can see? You can see the optic disc. Then you can see the macula. Inside the macula, you see the fovea centralis. And you also see the foveola. Foveola. The different diameters you have already written. In the central retina, you have optic disc, you have macula, you have fovea centralis and foveola. So, see, you can write the differences between the direct ophthalmoscopy and the indirect ophthalmoscopy. And these are actually the pictures or the images of your direct and indirect ophthalmoscope. These are the pictures of your direct ophthalmoscope and indirect ophthalmoscope. Direct ophthalmoscope say you are looking directly into the patient's eye. That is why it is called as direct. Indirect means you are putting the head bent. This is, uh, this is put over the head. We are putting this over the head and then you are using an additional lens. This is your plus 20 diopter lens that we are using. That is why it is called as indirect ophthalmoscopy. So, you should know the differences. You should be able to identify them also. What is direct ophthalmoscopy, distinct direct ophthalmoscopy and the indirect ophthalmoscopy? Radhika, now have you copied beta? Everybody has understood this, has copied this. Please let me know. Let me know, otherwise I will show you again. Now we come to the blood supply of the uh, retina. The blood supply. Now, if I talk about the blood supply, I can divide it into the two parts. Like we have 
the outer four layers plus the macula and you have the inner six layers. Everybody has noted down? Yes? All right. So, we can divide the blood supply of the eye into two parts. On one side, I have outer four layers which are towards the outer side and on one side, I have got inner six layers. So, these outer four layers of the retina along with the macula, these are supplied by the choriocapillaries. They are dependent upon the choriocapillaries for their nutrition. They are not dependent upon the retina, uh, retinal artery for their uh, nutrition. But if you talk about the inner six layers, these inner six layers are getting the blood from central retinal artery. They are getting the blood from central retinal artery. This is your central retinal artery. All right. The blood supply can be divided into two parts, outer part by the choriocapillaries and the inner part by the central retinal artery like this. Next, we will come to the layers of the retina. Layers of the retina. Layers of retina are 10. Layers of the retina are 10. Now, if you see these layers from out to in, if you see these layers from outer side to the inner side, then the first is RPE layer, retinal pigment epithelium. The outermost layer of the retina is the pigment epithelium, retinal pigment epithelium. Now, this is called as pigment epithelium. Why it is called as pigment epithelium? Because it contains the pigments. It contains more amount of pigment like uh, we have got the melanin. That is why it looks actually blackish in color. So, it contains pigment, retinal pigment epithelium. So, this is the outer side of the retina. So, this will be in contact with the Brooks membrane of the choroid because outer to retina is the choroid. So, on the outer side of the retina, I will have the Brooks membrane of the choroid. Then leave one line, okay, leave one line and then write the layer of rods and cones. Then you have the layer of rods and cones. Rods and cones are photoreceptors. Rods and cones are the photoreceptors. Now, they are also first order neurons. They are also considered as the first order neurons. Now, I know there is a lot of controversy on this, which is the first order neurons, but according to the latest edition of Yanov, now they say that the photoreceptors are the first order neurons. But still, some books, some of the standard books are, are having the mixed opinion. So, the rods and cones. Then you have got a membrane. This is your external limiting membrane. You have the external limiting membrane. On the external side, I have external limiting membrane. Now, if you see here, this layer of rods and cones, this actually contains the now, uh, if you people are not having the space on that same page, you can write it on your next page also, like left and right, Hannah. So, you can write here also. 
So it contains the outer segment and the inner segment. The layer of rods and cones, I will show you that what is outer segment and inner segment. So basically, uh, if you see the structure of rod and cone, I will show you in the picture also, it contains outer segment and then it contains a inner segment. Suppose this is outer segment, this is inner segment. So this area is actually present in the layer of rods and cones. Then you have nothing, you have got this external limiting membrane. And then comes your layer number 4. So, layer number 4 is the outer nuclear layer. Then you have the outer nuclear layer. So, what you have in the outer nuclear layer? Nuclear means you have nuclei. So, it contains the nuclei of the rods and cones. It contains nuclei of rods and cones. This is actually a AIMS question. Three years back this was asked. That nuclei of rods and cones are present in which layer? In the outer nuclear layer. So see this. So it was coming. This was your external limiting membrane. Then is your nuclear layer. So you have a dark nuclei here. So this is outer nuclear layer. And then you have got the synaptic cleft. So, this is your synaptic cleft. This is the synaptic cleft. This layer is called as outer plexiform layer. So, this is the total structure of the rods and cones. You have outer segment. Then you have inner segment. This is present in the layer of rods and cones. Then you have external limiting membrane. Then you have the outer nuclear layer which contains the nuclei of rods and cones. Then you have the synaptic cleft that is present in the outer plexiform layer. Have you drawn this? So, after the outer nuclear layer, you will have outer plexiform layer which contains the synaptic cleft of rods and cones. So, this will help you in solving so many questions from the last three years. Every time they are asking a question related to this. That is why I am writing in such a detail. Now, number 6, these layers will repeat on inner side. So, I will have inner nuclear layer as well as the inner plexiform layer. I will have the inner nuclear inner plexiform. So, outer plexiform ko hum lik sakte hai OPL. Then inner nuclear ko INL. Now inner nuclear. So again it contains the nuclei. It contains the nuclei of bipolar cells. It contains the nuclei of bipolar cells. This is main. But we also have two other kind of cells. Followed by we have uh, two kind of cells more. One is Emma Krein cells. Then you also have horizontal cells. And Mueller cells. So you have so many cells here. But the main one is your bipolar. Main is your bipolar cells. So, we have hub of cells. So, many cells are present here. Then the next is your plexiform layer. Inner plexiform layer contains the synapse. This synapse is between this bipolar, bipolar cells. 
and the ganglionic cells synapse between the bipolar cells and the ganglionic cells now i do require a synapse why because if you see here we know that rods and cones are first order neurons so they will generate the action potential okay so they are generating the potential here from this first order this will go to bipolar cells because bipolar cells are your second order these are your second order and from bipolar cells i require a synapse to the ganglionic cells because these are third order first order second order third order are you able to write yes or no then coming to the eighth one Eighth is your ganglionic cell layer. Ganglionic cell layer. This is GCL, ganglionic cell layer. Obviously, ganglionic is one other because on this side I had the bipolar cells, and here I am having a synapse between bipolar and ganglionic. So this side I I will have the ganglionic now. So I will have ganglionic. So this ganglionic cell layer. ganglionic cell layer contains what it contains the it contains the dendrites of the ganglionic cells it contains the dendrites of the ganglionic cells because axons are not present here where you have axons in the next layer nerve fiber layer in the nerve fiber layer i have so this nerve fiber layer contains the axons of ganglionic cells now this is very very important nerve fiber layer continues to form the optic nerve nerve fiber layer continues to form the optic nerve therefore in the optic neuropathy you had studied just now the glaucoma glaucoma mein what was happening it was a multifactorial optic neuropathy characterized by retinal ganglionic cell death so why i have this ganglionic cell death in neuropathy because this nerve fiber layer because this nerve fiber layer contains the axons of ganglionic cells that is why whenever i have neuropathy i will have ganglionic cell death and then finally i will have number 10 that is your internal limiting membrane finally i will have internal limiting membrane so these are the 10 layers of the retina along with the cells which are present inside them which layer continues to form the optic nerve that also you have seen which layer continues to form the optic nerve where you have dendrites of ganglionic cells which are third order second order where you have the nuclei of the bipolar cells where you have the nuclei of rods and cones what are your first order then if you see here we had left a space here this space what is this space i had said that leave one line here so this is actually a space called as sub retinal space this space is called as sub retinal space which contains the sub retinal fluid 
सब रेटिनल स्पेस कंटेनिंग सब रेटिनल फ्लूड एस आर एफ मतलब सब रेटिनल फ्लूड दिस स्पेस कंटेन्स द सब रेटिनल फ्लूड नाउ आई हैव गॉट ब्रॉडली टू लेयर्स ऑफ द रेटिना देर फोर आई I am writing here because I don't have space there now. So I can say that retina actually consists of two layers. One is the RPE layer, then another is the neurosensory retina. Another is the neurosensory retina. This is one, and this consists of nine layers. So on one side I have the pigment epithelium. and on another side i have got nine layers in the neurosensory retina and in the center i have the sub retinal space so you can answer a number of questions from this where do you have the sub retinal space where do you have the sub retinal fluid how many layers are present in the neurosensory retina now this neurosensory retina is actually transparent this neurosensory retina is transparent and colorless that is why you get a red glow that is why you get a red glow from the choroid if the retina is having its own color obviously you won't be able to see the red glow from the chorio capillaries because the majority of the part of the retina is transparent it is colorless and therefore you get a red glow from the chorio capillaries or the choroid while this pigment epithelium contains the pigments yes so on this side of the rpe you will have choroid and on this side of the neurosensory retina you will have the vitreous you will have the vitreous so this is how the orientation will take place i will have vitreous then the neurosensory retina then the subretinal space then i will have the rpe and then i will have choroid let us draw it also you will get to understand suppose this is your vitreous cavity so this is your vitreous here right so i will say this is your vitreous after the vitreous this is your neurosensory retina then you will have the subretinal space and then you will have the rpe layer suppose this is your rpe layer and uh, then i will have the choroid then i will have the choroid so try to see the orientation this is your vitreous then this is your neuro sensory retina then this will be your sub retinal space then this will be the rpe layer and outside the rpe you have choroid so this will help you in understanding the orientation of the layers of retina have you written this is this clear up till now anything <clears throat> that you want to ask any doubt have you understood this area now certain important things certain important things number 1 the layer which is most resistant to the radiations the layer which is most resistant to the radiation is the rpe layer followed by the ganglionic cell layer number 2 the layer most sensitive the layer which is most sensitive to the radiations 
this will be your layer of rods and cones this will be your layer of rods and cones number 3 the layer which continues in the optic nerve that is your nerve fiber layer that is your nerve fiber layer now what happens we have got so many layers here but all the layers mostly do not show the pathology so there are certain layers which show the pathology number 4 layers most prone to the pathology the layers which are most prone to pathology is the open this is your mnemonic you can remember it as open so you have op and in you have got two things op op means you have outer plexiform layer and in means the inner nuclear layer so these two layers are most prone to the pathologies whenever you have pathology it is mostly found in these two layers outer plexiform and the inner nuclear layer and you can learn it as that it opens the gate for the diseases you can learn it like this that it is opening the gate for the retinal diseases it is op and in now all these 10 layers are not present in the fovea and foveola all these layers are not present if you look at the macula macula contains all 10 layers macula contains all the 10 layers of the retina but if you look at the foveola and the fovea centralis but if you look at the foveola and the fovea centralis then all these layers are not present here so what are the layers which are present in the foveola we have got the retinal pigment epithelium then number 2 the layer of cones so here i am not writing the rods because it mainly consists of cones then number 3 outer limiting membrane or you can say external limiting membrane outer limiting membrane or external limiting membrane then outer nuclear layer outer nuclear layer and internal limiting membrane foveola just contain five layers only five layers are present in the foveolar area that is why the floor of the fovea was very very thin very very thin now if you look at fovea centralis it has 5 plus 1 so it has total six layers it has total six layers we have got again the rpe layer then we have got the layer of cones the layer of the cones then we have external limiting membrane external limiting membrane that is same number 4 outer nuclear layer now here you also have number five that is outer plexiform layer this is also called as henle's layer the outer plexiform layer which is present in the fovea centralis is henle's layer and then finally internal limiting membrane finally internal limiting membrane so in this way you do not have all the layers you do not have all the layers in the foveola and fovea centralis in the fovea centralis we have got six layers in the foveola we have got five layers 
that is why you will see that it is seen as a depression when i will show you the investigation like oct you will see that it is seen as a depression so usually you get a question that which layers are absent so apart from these layers the other layers are absent in the fovea and the foveola have you written this Now, after this, we'll be doing the histo of retina. Because many times they are asking a question related to the histology of the retina. So, try to, let us try to see the histology of the retina. Now, see, these kind of histological section, they are usually showing and then they are asking which side or which particular layer of retina it is. So, I will tell you how to number and do the nomenclature of the layers of the retina. Okay. I uh, will take these uh, pictures on that side so that we can discuss there. All right. Suppose you are being given like this, the section of retina and uh, suppose they are saying that like this and which layer it is. So, how to do such kind of a question? See, first of all, what is your step one? Step one is you have to see the side. Which one is your external side and which one is your internal side? The step number one is you have to see which side of the retina it is. So, how to see whether it is external side or internal side? For external side, first try to see the choroid. If you are not able to recognize the choroid, you can see the pigment epithelium, retinal pigment epithelium. If you are not able to see even the pigment epithelium, then try to see the rods and cones. Then try to identify the rods and cones. Obviously, you will be able to see anything of at least one of them. Like for example, if you see here, see this. Can you see the pigmented layer, this one? This layer is so much pigmented. So, this is your pigment epithelium. So, that this means now I can say that this side will be your external side. Sorry. So, I will come to know that this side will be the external side and therefore this side will be the internal side. Then this side will be the internal side. Now, whenever you are asked, try to concentrate on the middle layers. Can you see these layers which are darkly pigmented? These layers are your darkly pigmented layers. This layer is also your darkly pigmented. So, the two layers which are darkly pigmented are actually the nuclear layer. These two are nuclear layer because they are darkly pigmented. Now, you already know that this is your RPE. Therefore, this is outer nuclear and this is your inner nuclear. So, two layers you have already understood. One is your outer nuclear which is towards the pigment epithelium. So, the other one will be your inner nuclear layer. Now, if you see the middle one, so you have now this plexiform layer and I will have this also plexiform layer. So, one which is after outer nuclear will be outer plexiform and one which is after inner nuclear will be inner plexiform. So, mostly they are asking you about these four layers. Any of these four layers asked. So, you have to see whether you are able to see the single layer of cells present in the pigment epithelium or you can even see the section of choroid. So, if they are showing you the section of the choroid, you can see the lumen of the cut vessels. This is your lumen of cut vessels in the choroid. So, if it is a choroid, then you will be able to see the lumen of cut vessels in the choroid. From there also, you will come to know that this is a outer section or the second is the RPE layer. Now, sometimes like this time what they did, they are giving you at this level. 
So I am not seeing RPL, I am not seeing choroid, then how will I come to know which side is outer and which side is inner, see this. Then also you can do it. So for that I have another technique here. Try to see these, can you see these long segments here? These are your outer segment and inner segment. Then you will come to know that this is your outer segment and inner segment. So what is this? Photoreceptors. So these are your photoreceptors. So the, that means this is your external side. That means this is your external side. So again I can say that this is outer nuclear. This is outer nuclear. Sorry. Somehow it is not taking color. So this is your outer nuclear, then this is your outer plexiform, then inner nuclear and then inner plexiform. So are you understanding how to do it? See the two pigmented layers, that is two nuclear layers. Then look at the choroid or the RPE or the outer segment and inner segment. So that side will become the outer side. So towards that side you will have this outer nuclear. This will be your outer nuclear, the next will be outer plexiform, then inner nuclear and inner plexiform. This is the finest way and the easiest way and the coolest way of telling the histological section from wherever they are giving you, you can easily tell which layer it is. Now give me a thumbs up if you have understood this. Can you solve this kind of a question now? Tell me if you have understood this. How to read the histological section? How to read the histological section of the retina? Everybody has understood or not? Please tell me. Yes, everybody has understood. Okay. Now, instead of the histological section, sometimes they are giving this way also. Sometimes they are giving this way also, so that will again appear same. Now, see this. You have got this one. Can you see this one? This is your single layer of cuboidal cells and they are darkly pigmented. So, this is your pigment epithelium, retinal pigment epithelium. Then the next one. Now, see this. This is your outer segment. Then this is your inner segment. Outer segment, inner segment. So, this is your layer of photoreceptors. So, next is your layer of photoreceptors. I have made you right there in the theory itself there. Okay. Then the next was your nuclear layer. See, this is nuclei. So, this is outer nuclear. Outer nuclear will contain what? The nuclei of rods and cones. So, you have written this. Nuclei of rods and cones. And then the next was synaptic cleft or synaptic body. So this synaptic cleft was present where? In the outer plexiform layer. Outer plexiform layer. Then coming to the next one. Next is your inner nuclear layer. So what did I write there? Nuclei of the bipolar cells. These are the nuclei of bipolar cells. Can you see these? These are your, oh sorry. These are your nuclei. Can you see these ones? These are your nuclei of the bipolar cells. Mainly it is bipolar. But I did told you that you have got other cells also. You have got Mueller cells. You have got amacrine cells, horizontal cells and bipolar cells. But if they are asking you one, then your answer is bipolar cells. Then your answer is bipolar cells. Then coming to the next. Next is your inner plexiform layer. Inner plexiform layer contains the synapse of the bipolar cells with the ganglionic cells. Because this side pe we have bipolar cells and that side I have the ganglionic cell layer. And ganglionic cell layer was containing what? Dendrites of the ganglionic cells. So it is a sandwich here. On one side I have ganglionic cells. On one side I have bipolar cells. Or which may I have the synapse of both. Now... In the ganglionic cell layer, I have dendrites. So the exons are going in the nerve fiber layer. So this is your exons of ganglionic cells going in the nerve fiber layer. And nerve fiber layer is forming what? Optic nerve. Nerve fiber layer is forming what? Optic nerve. 
and finally I have this layer. Can you see this very very thin layer? Uh, this one, this layer is your internal limiting membrane. So finally I will have internal limiting membrane. So these are the total 10 layers of the retina. Which layers are present in which area? Macula contains all the layers. Which layers in fovea and which layers in foveola? How to read the histological section? What are the peculiarities of the different layers? All we have done. No, uh, there is no mnemonic actually uh, uh, till now. But the thing is that you know that the outer one is your pigment epithelium. And obviously, I require the photoreceptors on the outer side because they will take the light. So, we have uh, the pigment epithelium. Then I will have photoreceptors and then a limiting membrane. And then I have a repeat. Outer nuclear, outer plexiform, inner nuclear, inner plexiform. And then we have ganglionic cell layer, nerve fiber layer and the internal limiting membrane. So, I do not have any mnemonic. I will try if, if I can make any. Okay. Then I will talk about the blood retinal barrier. There is a thing called as the blood retinal barrier. So, there is a barrier between the retina and the blood so that the things do not mingle up. There are two kind of barriers. One is your outer blood retinal barrier and the second is the inner blood retinal barrier. Outer blood retinal barrier and the inner. Outer is formed by the tight junctions. Tight junctions of the RPE layer, retinal pigment epithelium, the tight junctions of the retinal pigment epithelium outer barrier, while the inner is formed by the retinal vascular endothelium. So, you have got two barriers. The outer barrier is formed by the tight junctions of the retinal pigment epithelium while the inner is formed by the vascular endothelium. Now, the outer barrier is broken in the CSR and CME. You will be reading these in retina, central serous retinopathy and the cystoid macular edema while the inner Inner barrier is broken in the diabetic retinopathy, hypertension retinopathy. In the diabetic retinopathy and the hypertension retinopathy. So, this was in short, you know, about the uh, normal anatomy as well as the physiology of the retina. You have got, you know, two kind of cells here, rods and cones. They are forming the blood retinal barriers, the blood supply, the layers, the ophthalmoscope, the parts. So, here we take a break of uh, 15 minutes and then we will resume, okay? See you after the break. If any doubt, please type on the group.